So we're celebrating Debussy's 150th birthday this year. Now, Debussy may not appear like uh, an, a, a revolutionary, but the truth is, if you had to say what single musician possibly changed the course of music more than any other, a lot of people would have to answer Claude Debussy. So I'm going to just explain a little bit this evening about that transformative force who was so understated and soft-spoken in many ways. Debussy was born in Saint-Germain-en-Laye, outside of Paris. His parents ran a china store downstairs and the family lived upstairs. They were poor. The early years of Debussy's life were marked by having to move around um, France trying to find gainful employment for his father. And um, when his father did settle into a place, he usually got in trouble. And so for a while, Debussy was living with an aunt. Sometime when he was five or six, the aunt noticed that he had an affinity for music. He was singing in pitch. He was imitating what he heard. And she found him a piano teacher. And this woman, uh, Madame de Motet de Fleurville, said that she had studied with Chopin, but in fact, that's not documented anywhere. <laughs> However, Debussy liked Chopin's music, and so the mere fact that she said this was very uh, inspiring to him. And as a young boy, he auditioned for the Paris Conservatory. Now, the Paris Conservatory took eight students a year, any age, whether they were 10 or 15 or 20. And Debussy was one of the eight students accepted that year, so he must have been quite exceptional with what Madame Motet de Fleurville had taught him. Now, Debussy's first years at the conservatory were marked by his teachers saying, he doesn't follow all the rules and he has a, a you know, but what 10 year old boy would be different? So I think that it's unfair to say that the Paris Conservatory didn't recognize his genius because of thousands of teenage boys studying at the Paris Conservatory, probably most of them could have been considered unruly and wanting to break the rules. So in hindsight, we could say, oh, they didn't recognize, but Debussy did fine, obviously, as we all know. So. Uh, the Paris Conservatory was filled with all the great names of French music. Gounod taught there, and Massenet taught there, and César Franck taught there, and they'd all been students there in their time. The Paris Conservatory allowed you to stay if, every so many years, you won first prize in one of their competitions. So it was sort of the Goldman Sachs of music schools. You know, If you didn't <laughs> cut it, you were out. So little Debussy, um, first won a piano prize playing lots of Chopin. He, he loved Chopin, and all of his life he loved Chopin. Later in life, he even created an edition of Chopin's music, uh, something that he didn't do for any other composer. He loved Chopin, he loved Bach, and he loved Mozart. He said that Beethoven was clearly a genius with bad taste. <laughs> and, <laughs> Debussy began to write his own music, and studied uh, composition with a teacher who felt that his talent should be encouraged. Um, they tended to criticize his open-ended forms because music can either be composed along strict architectural lines or with a certain amount of liberty, and Debussy uh, was on the side of liberty. The first really influential teacher, however, was his piano teacher who said, if you're going to make it in the concert world, you will have to learn to move around in high society with more ease than you have. So he said, this summer, to the 15-year-old Debussy, you're going to go to a wealthy count's home. He lives in a chateau on a river with 300 acres and a beautiful daughter, and need he have said more, Debussy spent the summer there had a lovely affair with the beautiful daughter and <laughs> played for the family every night. So um, the following summer, the teacher said, why don't you go spend the summer with Nadezhda von Meck? Now, some of you may recognize that name as Tchaikovsky's patroness. Tchaikovsky wrote much of his greatest music under the patronage of Nadezhda von Meck. 
And so 16, 17, 18 year old Debussy, all three summers in a row, went and stayed with the Mech family and they took him all over Europe. So he heard great performances in Venice and in Florence. He heard um, the orchestras of the time. It was a wonderful experience for him. And apparently, according to Nadezhda von Meck, young Debussy was very charming and engaging and a great mimic. So Tchaikovsky finally met Debussy and Debussy proudly showed him some of his music. And Tchaikovsky said, well, you're very talented, but this music is shriveled up. It only lasts a few minutes which is exactly what Debussy wanted. Even at the age of 16 or 17, he felt that the forms that had been handed down to him had been explored so fully that what else could he do? So he really wanted to find new forms. One of the interesting things about Debussy's inspirations was that they were not purely musical. He loved visual art. He loved literature and poetry. So he knew all of the French poems and the French literature of the time, and because of his travels, he even knew some of the German literature. Now, Debussy chose uh, texts for some songs because it happened that Madame Motet de Fleurville had a son-in-law named Paul Verlaine. And uh, Paul Verlaine, as you probably know, was a great French poet. And Debussy was really taken with his poetry. So he wrote an early song to a poem of Verlaine's. And unfortunately, that song does not survive. Um, he had a muse, however. Um, once he was back at the conservatory, he had a patron, uh, Monsieur Vasnier, with a wife who was only 12 years older than Debussy, but much younger than her husband. And quickly, Debussy formed a liaison with this young Madame Vasnier, who was a singer in the accompaniment class. So Debussy had to win a first prize in accompanying in order to get into the accompanying class with the older boys. And he succeeded in this. He had um, an incentive. So <laughs> he wrote 40 songs for Madame Vasnier, all the time taking lots of money from her husband, who was his patron, and in fact writing um, the husband lots of letters about his artistic progress and everything else. So we do know the very first song that remains to us that Debussy wrote for Madame Vasnier. It's a song called Nuit d'Etoile. The poet is Théodore de Bonville, and the poem says, uh, starry night under your veils, under your breezes, I smell the scent of the air, and I dream of dead love. I, this was a late 19th century poem, what do you want? <laughs> now, in the poem that the poet Bonville writes, there's a quatrain at the end where the poet makes it clear that um, the love is dead in a physical sense, because it talks about, I. Uh, dream about you in your winding sheet, in, in your shroud. But Debussy didn't want to be so explicit because he had already experienced love that lived and died and he'd moved on. So the way he sets the poem, it's melancholy perhaps, but it's not tragic. And this is already a glimmer of the future Debussy who prefers ambiguity to making something crystal clear. So now I would like you to welcome Jenna Browning, who's going to sing Nuit d'Etoile.
end of that piece written by Debussy at age 17, you heard Revo's Amour de Hef, right, instead of that augmented chord was later to become not something which resolved to a final major chord, but was actually the resolution itself. Now, forgive me, Augmented chords are made up of whole steps. And because they're made up of whole steps only, there is no distinction between where's the bottom and where's the top, what is the root. And this chord, for example, changes a long-standing concept of traditional Western music, which is tonality. Tonality is the feeling that a song or a symphony or anything is rooted in a particular key. Now the song you just heard was rooted in a particular key. That key. But because of this chord, it's a song straining to get out of that key. So now, Debussy reads more. And of course, he's exposed to all the music around him, some of which is like Brahms. Also moving out of having a very clearly defined tonality. So Debussy finds a poet, Stéphane Mallarmé. Stéphane Mallarmé wrote poetry which explicitly avoided the concrete in every way. He stated that the creed of the symbolist poets, symbol with an S, not crash, the, the symbolist <laughs> poets was to let every line be a symbol for something else, but never to state explicitly what that something else might be. And that that was a whole new literary credo that poets would attempt to be ambiguous and suggestive, but never tarnish something by stating its name explicitly. So Mallarmé wrote poetry which was much more abstract than the poetry, say, by Bonville that you just heard, where it's clearly about uh, love that is dead, whether the lover has actually died or the love has simply ended. So now we would like to perform a song for you by Stéphane Mallarmé, Debussy's music, called Apparition, Apparition. I'm just going to tell you a little bit of the text. It says, um, the, the moon became sad. Seraphims who were um, crying were dreaming with their, their bows on their fingers uh, in the calm of flowers exuding vapors. It was the blessed day of your first kiss. Okay, so it's explicit enough that it's a love poem, but there are many images that are not so specific. And when you hear the music written only two years after that other song, you'll hear how Debussy's tonal and musical language has evolved to be far less 
crystal clear and much more ambiguous than in the first song we sang you. So this is Apparition by Debussy with words by Stéphane Mallarmé. say to me, well, that did end in a key. And I would say, yes, it did. But it's not the key that it started in. And there aren't too many three minute songs written before then that start and end in different keys. And even the key it starts in is a little hard because it immediately Debussy adds. So the professors at the conservatory were not sure they liked this kind of music. They knew that Debussy was a very talented young man, but they were not sure that this was acceptable. Now, every year, the huge prize at the Paris Conservatory, the Prix de Rome, the Prize of Rome, was awarded to the student who could write a winning cantata. A cantata meaning a work for orchestra, voices, but not a staged opera. So Debussy submitted a cantata, fresh from the triumph of these songs. 
the panel at the Paris Conservatory was not at all pleased <laughs> with the results of this cantata because harmonically it opened all kinds of questions and it was very difficult to tell where these chords would resolve. Somebody even coined the phrase non-functional harmony <laughs> as, <laughs> as a criticism because Debussy would use chords that imply harmony for their coloristic value without having them resolve or move forward in the way that those chords are supposed to resolve. So now we wouldn't say that the harmony was non-functional, but that the, the function of those harmonies was very different from the way harmonies had been used before. So Debussy did not win the Prix de Rome, which he very much wanted to do. And so the following year, he tried even harder. He put all of his efforts into something that poured his musical soul out. And need I say, they were even more horrified. <laughs> so the third year, when Debussy had his last and final chance to win the Prix de Rome, and the work was about to be done, all of his friends were sitting in the audience rubbing their hands saying, we can't wait because this year is going to be total lunacy. We know it. That's the direction that Debussy is going. But Debussy showed that he actually could be pragmatic. The head of the jury was the great composer Jules Massenet. Now Massenet himself had written 32 operas, well he hadn't by then, but in his career he wrote 32 operas. And um, he was a master of orchestration and coloration in the stage. However, he stayed very much within the late Romantic model as far as tonality. So what we're going to do is perform a little excerpt for you from one of Massenet's own operas written at almost exactly the same time. And then Jenna is going to sing a full aria from Debussy's third attempt to win the Prix de Rome. Okay, so first you're going to hear some Massenet. Now Massenet tended to favor melodramatic subjects for his serious operas. And this is an operatic setting of El Cid. Um, so in French, Le Cid. And Le Cid has this heroine who is distraught, her lover has been killed, all the things that you would expect in a romantic opera. And um, <laughs> first there's a bit of recitative or unaccompanied singing, and then the orchestra comes in. We'll just do 30 seconds of it for you. It is really good music, there's no question, but there's no augmented chord in sight, and we certainly stay firmly in the same key of B minor the whole time. So Debussy, clever fellow that he is, writes this aria in B minor, in fact, the same key, and although he cannot resist 
doing certain coloristic and harmonic things, I think you'll see that he follows the model of that style of composition. The cantata text that he chose is the prodigal son, and Leah, the mother, sings about how the years follow the years, and the joy of the other people in the village just makes me sad and tired because Azael, my son, is gone forever.
not to keep you in suspense, Debussy won the Prix de Rome. <laughs> Even though he followed the model of the traditional romantics, there are certain things that he was able to get away with that were not part of the language. We don't really go from a major key to the major key, a whole step below it in traditional harmony. Bach had written hundreds of chorales, and we all know that you're not supposed to write parallel fifths or parallel octaves, and Debussy did do these things. He did do things like this at the end. So he gave just a little coloristic sense that he had a whole other language to share, but he didn't step beyond the border to uh, infuriate the judges, and so he was sent to Rome. Now the plan was you spent three years in Rome and you wrote works there while living in a villa. The only good thing about Rome was that he met Franz Liszt. Uh, Debussy hated his time in Rome and he didn't stay the full three years. Um, Debussy was obsessed for much of his life with the opera Tristan and Isolde. He felt that it was the absolute pinnacle of romantic writing and that after Tristan and Isolde, nothing else could be done. So a lot of the time in Rome, he spent playing through the piano vocal score of Tristan and Isolde, singing all the parts, playing all the parts. And later in Paris, it was a party trick that he could go to a party and just sing the entire score of Tristan and Isolde. <laughs> So he had internalized this work to an incredible extent. It should not surprise us that elements of Tristan and Isolde come out in his music. The chord that is famously called the Tristan chord, this chord, occurs in Debussy's music constantly. However, as I said in Nuit d'Etoile, he takes the augmented chord and he resolves it. Wagner resolves the Tristan chord. And four hours later, it finally <laughs> to a B major chord. <laughs> Debussy doesn't feel that need. So he writes this music and it retains an unresolved quality. Now, uh, this is skipping ahead in history a little bit, but um, uh, Mallarmé had also written a poem called The Afternoon of a Fawn. Okay, so this um, Afternoon of a Fawn starts Debussy's musical treatment of it. Now to us that probably doesn't sound shocking, but this interval doesn't belong to any key. A flute plays this. need to ask you what chord it is, right? So here's the, the first chord in this famous orchestral piece written in the early 1890s is the Tristan chord. And then a whole bar of nothing, like, well, was that enough? <laughs> then he repeats. because that melody at the beginning that was played by the flute has a tritone in it and belongs to no key, he can harmonize it in different ways because nothing has been suggested to us. A minute later, it's... And another minute later, it's big 11th chord. Right, so if the third time around the Tristan chord says, I was here all along, you just didn't know it. <laughs> so I think that what Debussy achieved in this piece cannot be overestimated. 
essentially it's a piece without tonality, without rhythm, and uh, without melody. Of course, it has beautiful melodies, but they're all fragments as if what Mallarmé tried to do with words, suggest something by saying something else. So many of those chords might make us think, oh, it's going to do that something else, but it never does. So while we all know about the riot provoked by the Rite of Spring uh, 20 years later in Paris in 1913, the bigger revolution was really this afternoon of a fawn in which suddenly key and rhythm uh, all dissolve in a way that because most of the piece is quiet seems quite unassuming and not revolutionary. So it's really a very quiet manifesto. Now Debussy was extraordinarily conscientious. It was a long process for him to write a piece of music. These pieces that seem so effortless uh, took years of his intense concentration. Following him all the time, however, was this phantom shadow of Tristan and Isolde. And he wanted to write, Debussy wanted to write an opera. So his stated intention was that he would go as far away from Wagner as possible in every way. The subject he chose comes from a play by Maurice Maeterlinck, and the play is called Peleas and Melisande. Now, you remember that Tristan and Isolde is a story about two people who fall hopelessly in love even though the character to whom the woman is betrothed is somebody dear to both of them. So in order to go as far away as possible, Peleus and Melisande is about two people who are hopelessly in love even though the character to whom Melisande is betrothed is very dear to both of them. <laughs> The, the story had gone so deeply, I think, into Debussy, uh, both set in medieval times. Uh, however, the extraordinary difference that needs to be stated up front is that while Wagner's characters always express themselves, they curse, they love, they're passionate, they're, they're raging, uh, Debussy's characters almost never say anything. Richard Strauss heard this opera and he says, my God, it's the first opera without singing. <laughs> because every time a character says something, they talk around it. If they want to say, I miss you, they say the light falling on the surface of the water in the well. You know, and, and it's extraordinarily beautiful, but it was a completely new sensibility to everybody. So when Melisande uh, finally uh, declares her love for Peleos, it's because she lets down her long copious hair and he says, your hair is falling down. And we all understand what that means. So this is an opera where nothing is out in the open. It's, it's an opera that took Debussy 12 years to compose. And he felt that he had finally purged himself of, of Wagner. But of course, even though it's much quieter and somewhat shorter, the opera is full of Wagner chords mm -hmm. and doesn't ever uh, resolve in the same way that Wagner's opera, as I said, takes four hours to reach the final beautiful B major at the end. Peleas and Melisande is the same time transcending aesthetic of composition. So in some ways, Debussy paid a huge homage to Wagner and finally exorcised that from himself. <laughs> the extraordinary things that Debussy did in these next years uh, continued to baffle, but by now people were accepting the symbolist movement, and now I'll finally use the word impressionist, a word that Debussy never cared for. He felt that if he was setting symbolist poetry, yes, he was being ambiguous on purpose, but he felt that composition that was very carefully crafted shouldn't be called impressionist. It doesn't merely give an impression. So impressionist uh, painters, of course, we know about. Impressionism was never used as a label for writers. And Debussy wanted to be thought of in the same way that the poets and the novelists were thought of. However, he did love the idea that through music, one could express things that couldn't be 
expressed in any other way. He said frequently, music is the, the most expressive of all the tools that we humans have. And he wanted more and more to try to express the actual feeling itself rather than something which led up to the feeling. Now, whether or not that ever could be successful, I leave for you to judge. But he said more and more as he started to compose and be recognized as one of France's great composers, that he wanted each little phrase to just be a light or a color. He loved the paintings of Turner where a sun is reflecting on water. So I'm going to play you a piece that Debussy wrote around 1904, 1905 called Reflections on the Water. This piece, therefore, is not a concrete object, but the images produced and the sensations that those images produced on the observer who's just seeing the reflections. So this is Debussy moving further and further into the realm of ambiguity and color.
Richard Strauss, who had already commented that Peleus and Melisande was an opera without singing, said, how, they, they knew one another, he said to Debussy, how do you expect to uh, win audiences over with pieces that begin and end very softly. He said, I, I don't know everything about composing, but I know that if it starts really loud and ends really loud, people <laughs> respond better to the piece. <laughs> and, and Debussy was never interested in that. His comment was, I am always going to write music to, that will be appreciated by five people. <laughs> and, <laughs> To a certain extent, this is still the case because uh, this wonderful crowd notwithstanding, uh, Debussy's music does not have the widespread popularity of Beethoven symphonies or Brahms symphonies or Tchaikovsky symphonies uh, because he explores such a refined uh, tonal region and often, you know, the music is mostly soft. So I think that uh, Debussy, of course, is popular and yet, um, his great symphony never gets played uh, in the way that the great romantic symphonies do. His great symphony is called La Mer, um, the sea. Now, La Mer uh, has three movements, which aren't you know, like Allegro, Andante, and Presto, the way a symphony is, but the first movement is called um, the sea from dawn till noon, and the second movement is called the play of the waves, and the um, the uh, third movement is called the dialogue of the wind and the waves. And, uh, so the critics at the time, 1910, when this work came out, uh, were, were baffled. Uh, one, one critic said, I don't know if there's any um, symphony in it, but there's a great part about 10 a.m. because he knew the first <laughs> movement was from <laughs> dawn till noon. But my favorite comment of all times about La Mer is that there was a music critic in Boston for many, many years named Richard Dyer great, brilliant man. I had the good fortune to meet him, and he had grown up in Kansas City uh, with a phonograph and the sea nowhere in sight. But finally, when he was 14, his parents took him to the seaside, and he said, oh my God, it's just like La Mer, <laughs> <laughs> which he had probably heard on phonograph records about 80,000 you know, times. So Debussy writes this great symphony, and, and it's not done very much, but I bet there's a part of it that you know when it goes. So, yes, that's familiar, right? That's the best tune in La Mer. But um, the, the fact is that all of this symphony doesn't belong to a single key. And the implication of that is not just that it breaks away from traditional harmony, but that it breaks away from much of what the classical and romantic symphonies did, which was give personality to different keys and to the, the approach uh, to a different key. You come to the home key and there's a sense of returning. That's not the way Debussy's psychology operates. Um, because I can't play you La Mer with a 100-piece orchestra, uh, I have s the closest thing that I can offer you, uh, which is a piano piece that Debussy wrote when he ran off with his second wife um, after, by the way, everybody Debussy ever had a relationship with it was always somebody he, he took from somebody else. He, <laughs> he didn't like to go, uh, go with women that were, were available. That just wasn't something that interested him. So uh, Emma Baldock was the wife of a respectable Paris banker, and she and Debussy fled to the Isle of Jersey. And um, the, the piece which came right about this time is called L'Ile Joyeuse, the Joyous Isle. And uh, this is Debussy's most extended piano piece, believe it or not, at five minutes. And um, this is, is something in the same spirit of La Mer. It captures uh, the ecstasy of of water, but also the parallel of the ecstasy of, of human psychology. Debussy said once, everything boils down to desire. So I think you'll hear that in this piece, L'Ile Joyeuse.
That was about the only loud ending Debussy ever wrote in his life, so <laughs> you heard it. So does anybody have any questions? This is a non-intermission uh, performance, by the way, so questions and then we all eat together. Yes? Joe, in a piece like that, uh, how often do you have to change uh, key signatures to change the sharps? Close? What a good question. Uh, so often, Debussy totally changes the key without changing the key signature. He'll write in all the accidentals. And in later music, influenced by Debussy, um, people no longer write key signatures often, but the accidentals are always there. Debussy probably influenced more classical composers than any other composer, but also uh, jazz. I mean, when you think of these, these chords that, that Debussy is using all the time, you know, it's, it's, uh, so who knows what key we're in, but he, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't have to change printed, exactly, doesn't print, change printed key signatures. Any other, yes? Well, I think that's a wonderful question. And, and sure, it's part of me. And I think every performer has certain music that they um, find just is somehow touching to them, touches them. So, so that certainly touches me. And, and I think that, uh, you know, there, there are pieces by Debussy that are better known, um, for example. Yeah, exactly. Tell Chuck I play this, would you? So this piece, in its simplicity, is truly beautiful. But just to speak personally, it doesn't touch me in the same way. Now, obviously, I'm in a minority because it's Debussy's most popular piece of music. But um, it's a wonderful question, because I think everybody finds things that, that speak to them. Uh, and how much of that is the composer? Well, probably a lot of it. You know, where, where do we intersect with the composer? Yeah. The prayer to Loon, it seems like it was in a key. It is. It's a much earlier piece. Claire de Lune is written in 1890 or 91, and it's, it's certainly in D-flat major. Um, a key that Debussy loved. But the thing about uh, these earlier pieces is Debussy's exploring the language that then becomes so much more prominent in La Mer and the later piano works and uh, image and the, the jeu and all kinds of things. Um, Debussy's, he, he never abandoned key completely. And in fact, in some of his later works, he came back to it a bit. If you had to say that there were a few features of all of Debussy's music, uh, you would say pentatonic. He heard a um, gamelan orchestra, uh, orchestra at the um, Paris Exposition in 1889. And he loved not only the pentatonic scales, but the fact that they intentionally didn't quite tune with each other so that there was always something a little, a little unusual. So pentatonic scales, whole tone scales, or something like. Um, then old French music, like music from the 17th century, he, he often would write in a sort of neo-French Baroque style. Um, and, and Claire de Lune belongs to a suite called Suite Bergamasque, Bergamasque sort of refers back to a, um, an old style of dance. And um, the other movements in that suite of four piano pieces have dance titles. There's a, a prelude and a um, minuet, and then the clair de lune and a, a passe-pied. So uh, Debussy 
did write in keys up to a certain point, but then he began to move further and further away from them and, there, and, and took the rest of the music world with him, essentially. Paul, you had a question. Yes, yeah, you must have done this a few times. I noticed you didn't have that to read. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that, I have done it before. I know. <laughs> a lot of times. It was really great. So. Yes. I think that's a perfect, I, I never thought of it that clearly, but uh, water and light were the two things that fascinated him. And, and water and light go on without end. So he resisted forms that had a very clear beginning and end. Even though Claire de Lune is in a key, it doesn't go, it, it starts like a moon ray out of nowhere. <laughs> so, so already that idea is there. Yeah, that's a wonderful observation. Anything? Yes? How did singers take to this new... Oh, God, did they hate it. The, the <laughs> stories about the first rehearsals of uh, Peleos and Melisande were constant mutiny. And uh, nobody wanted to sing it, and they thought Debussy was just an abhorrent monster. And, uh, <laughs> now... <laughs> Debussy, Debussy, by the time he was rehearsing the piece with the singers himself, had rectal cancer, and he said that just getting out of bed and getting dressed was like all the labors of Hercules combined. So I'm sure he might have had a reason to be a grumpy fellow. But uh, they, they all said that it was, it was so difficult because nobody had ever sung anything like this before. Yes. He probably would have loved that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I thought about this a lot, because the, the French and the Germans were political opponents by the time Debussy was writing, even his earliest music. And it wasn't just that he wanted to oppose traditional harmony, but the Germanic ideal of music was that it stood for something greater, and it left an impact, left a footprint. And I think Debussy wanted to leave footprint-free music. You know, that, that it was truly like light or like water. When it was there, it was there, but when it was gone, it was gone. Mm -hmm. So I, I love that you share that sensation. The Germans must have grabbed me. <laughs> <laughs> did he have any connection with Ravel? You know, they, they did not have a personal relationship. And while Ravel also uh, was born later and died later, um, is labeled Impressionist, um, they were very different. Ravel found a way to use the piano almost immediately. It took Debussy dozens of piano pieces, uh, which are musical gems, but really not pianistic at all, uh, before he sort of figured out the piano as an instrument, even though he himself was a superb pianist. So uh, the two of them are, are often lumped together, but really are quite different, uh, personally and, and psychologically. You were going to say something? No, okay. Yes, sir. What are Debussy's musical progeny? Well, Schoenberg, for sure. I'd say all of the serialists. Um, Aaron Copland claimed that his greatest influence was Debussy. John Adams has claimed that his greatest influence was Debussy. Uh, Bartok certainly was more influenced by Debussy than any other composer. And then, um, you know, if you take that on down to second and third generations, uh, I would say that Debussy has really affected uh, almost every contemporary composer, because um, if we think that the Romantic period really lasted until Richard Strauss's death in 1948, you know, that the four last songs are still German Romanticism, and Debussy had died 30 years before that, but all of the tradition that went on um, after, after the end of the 19th century was preserving Romanticism. It was Debussy who opened the whole floodgates to uh, an alternative language 
that didn't have uh, form in the same sense. And as I was saying uh, to this gentleman, didn't really have um, the need of having a meaning. Um, that's a very freeing concept, just the way it is in, say, abstract painting or um, abstract literature, that something doesn't have to have a meaning beyond what it is. That's a very influential philosophical idea. <laughs> I, I, that's too big of a question for me to answer. I mean, it's a wonderful question, but um, everything you've heard to your ears probably didn't sound wild and outrageous because we've heard this music, we've lived with it, and we've lived with the music that it's given birth to, which is much more out there than, than Debussy's music. So he wanted to be thought of like Turner's paintings. And we don't think of Turner as an abstract painter. And yet, most abstract painters will say, well, see, it began right there with, with Turner, because he was one of the first great painters to try to do something other than be purely representational, and to use light, and to use water as what they were, rather than what they represented. But I can't answer. Uh, it's too good of a question to answer. <laughs> Yes. How are they different? Sh what a great group you are. Um, Schubert's greatest musical tool was to shift between major and minor unexpectedly. And a major and minor key have the same uh, root. So while there are marvelous things that happen, Schubert doesn't try to break down the system of tonality. It's the fact that we're expecting an A-flat major chord and suddenly we hear a, an A-flat minor chord that, that makes Schubert so strong. So Schubert did have the idea, he was another composer, by the way, that Debussy lumped with Beethoven, a genius who didn't have great taste. Uh, <laughs> and needless to say, I don't agree with those comments at all, but, but to Debussy, uh, the, the compositional methods of Beethoven and Schubert were too evident. They, they, they weren't subtle enough for him. He saw uh, can you imagine Die Schöne Müllerin written by, by Debussy, you know, and if uh, instead of... What could be more German and wonderful than, than that? But it, w it would go... Right? And it would present a whole different... Oh my gosh. I can see what, what we're going to do next season. We're going to do a whole evening of what if, <laughs> right? <laughs> what if Bartok had written the Jupiter Symphony? We'll have a great time. Okay, I think we should all go have your homemade oatmeal cookies and many other things. Thank you all so much.